All the parties, the major parties operating in Britain, have promised a, a green industrial revolution of one form or another, but have, have, have not delivered either the revolution or the jobs. And I, I, I would say it's, uh, it, it, what's most interesting about it is that in, typically in an industrial revolution, you make things more abundant uh, and, and more cheap uh, 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 and, uh, and more uh, uh, reliable. Right. So, but none of those things has happened. Energy has become less reliable, more expensive um, and, and more scarce. Today on British Thought Leaders I sit down with Ben Pyle, an independent researcher, commentator and video maker. Ben runs the Climate Resistance website which challenges mainstream views on environmentalism and he writes for publications such as Spiked Online. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Hi, welcome to British Thought Leaders. Thanks, Lee. Good to be here. So, um, a lot of your work goes against the mainstream green agenda, and I think it's fair to say you're one of the few voices that are publicly doing that. Could you give us a bit about yourself and your background? Well, my work background, um, originally I was involved in um, software development, 3D graphics, um, visual, uh, visual effects, um, computer games, um, and that sort of thing. But um, around 22 years ago, um, I sort of, I, I was quite green at the time, I think, and, and you know, quite, quite, quite minded about the, you know, quite determined that that, that climate change was uh, one of our biggest problems to, to use the greens uh, uh, expression. But then, um, sort of gra gradually, I think the, the argument for me began to weaken, um, and I, I, I began to see environmentalism as a as a bigger problem than the climate change um, uh, problem. So um, I went back to school. I went back to university, did a degree in philosophy and politics, and then um, worked for a bit for the European Union, um, or for um, MEPs in the European Union, European Parliament anyway, um, and, and uh, began writing and, and, and blogging. So some, um, some people say, what, what are you doing not being a climate scientist intervening in the climate debate? What, have you got, what are your qualifications? They're very keen on. But my interest is very much in, in green ideology and green policy and, and, and how that doesn't necessarily um, reflect what the science says and a lot, you know, doesn't, doesn't acknowledge the weaknesses of the, uh, of the, of the scientific argument. Um, so you know, people typically call you a denier if you, if you express a a sceptical or critical view of, uh, of, of climate policy, but actually climate policy is very far removed from climate science. Um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, fast forwarding 20 years, gradually that writing's become more independent and um, I've been producing some films and, uh, and articles and, uh, and so on. So let's talk a bit about net zero. Yeah. It surprises me in my everyday life how little people know or, or talk about this thing, which seems like quite a, a big effect on everyone's lives at the moment. Could you give us an overview of the net zero situation? Well, net zero is the upgrading of the, well, in the UK, net zero is the upgrading of the Climate Change Act's uh, target from 80% reduction of CO2 emissions to effectively 100% CO2 emissions. So... <coughs> So net zero uh, doesn't really mean anything in and of itself, um, apart from this sort of very abstract uh, policy target, right? So it's a, it, I think of it more of as a blank check. Um, and, and when that, when, uh, when politicians talk about targets, they generally don't have an ad any idea about how they're going to be realized. So in the, uh, from, from 2008, when the Climate Change Act was passed, um, in many senses, they put the policy uh, cart before the technology horse, and they thought that if you if you created these targets, then 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 um, and, you, and you enforced them legally and made it harder for for businesses to uh, to to use energy and so on and so forth, then then solutions would come magically through the market. Um, but that hasn't been the case, um, and rather than realizing that it hasn't been the case. All that MPs seem to have done is uh, increase their ambition, as they as they call it. But um, uh, so they've increased it from eighty percent to hundred percent. But they've got no clearer idea, despite that being nearly fifteen years ago, how those targets are going to be met. Um, so so, uh, and behind behind that 
um, frustration that they haven't been able to realize their, those targets. Um, there is a, a huge uh, army of civil society organizations and academic institutions and so on pushing for those targets to be uh, realized um, and, and offering solutions or seemingly solutions. But um, I, I think these are all a bit for the birds in a sense because, because they, they, they all require behavior change, um, in, in, to use their their term for it. So the Climate Change Committee, for example, says that up to 63% of that 100% emissions reduction target is going to become is going to come from behaviour change. Now, what 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 that really means is a transformation of society. I mean, the behaviour of the people. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's almost a euphemism in, in in a sense. It doesn't it doesn't you know um, it sort of implies to most people for the superficial reading. Um, you're going to get a drop in replacement for your car or for your boiler, but actually, it, it's going to substantially reduce your freedom to travel. It's going, you know, if, if there's any any degree of implementation of it, it's going to change the way you eat. It's going to change the way, and so, you know, some some people, some people, um, some academics admit this, but that but that that, that that this is about social transformation, about a political transformation of society, but they um, they're not they're not on the front pages. That's not the story that gets, you know, those aren't the upsides that get sold to the public. They're not, they're not what's in the uh, political party's manifestos um, every election. They, they say, oh, it's going to be great. We're going to have EVs. We're going to have uh, green energy. But they, they don't spell that out. And they don't say we don't actually really know what the country is going to look like when we've banned the car, when we've banned the gas boiler, and, and everything has become more expensive. Um, and so... Basically, behaviour change means us, the people, the public, accommodating to to uh, uh, to the uh, incompleteness of the policy agenda. So we we have to bend around these designs for society, society, you know, and and it's it's not society, it's not policymakers serving us. We have to adapt to them. It's it's a complete inversion of politics. You mentioned several ways the um, net zero agenda affects the ordinary people. I was hoping we could dive into those a bit more. Mm. The government said that 16% of our carbon emissions come from the residential sector, i.e. Uh, people's houses. Mm. What changes are people expected to make to kind of meet these targets? Again, it's not clear what, what they have in mind because what well, they, they don't know, right? Again, the, the, the policy is put before the technology, but the suggestion is that we must retrofit our homes um, and, and that would rep require a substantial uh, refit. You know, the plaster comes off the walls, it might mean uh, external cladding, it might mean internal cladding. We replace uh, gas-fired central heating with uh, heat pumps um, and, and those require substantial insulation um, to, to, uh, to make them work. Um, because they're much more passive. You can't, you can't unlike a, a, a central heating boiler, you can't just turn it on and 20 minutes later your house is the temperature you need it to be. Um, it may be that you have to plan a lot more ahead and it has to be a constant temperature. Um, so, so um, uh, and then, and then um, you, you know, the, 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 at the moment this is, there is an attempt to get people to do this on their own um, using the energy performance certificates um, system. So every house, when you, see, you, you, you know, if you look on the property websites when you want to buy or sell your house, um, you'll see a little, a little chart. Now this, and th this will give you all your house, or the, this gives each house that's for sale a score, A, B, C, D, E, or F. And most houses in the UK, or the average house in the UK, gets a score D. And so um, the, the effect of net zero will mean you have to increase that D to a C and then that C to a B and B to an A and perhaps they will create new, new tiers. So if you want to sell your house, at some point it's not going to be legal to sell it unless it meets a certain, certain level, right? So, um, uh, you know, I've been looking at houses recently uh, interested in the, in the West Midlands um, where there's sort of very, very, uh, quite a lot of um, very typical Victorian terraced two up, two down type houses. And, and they were looking, they, you know, to, to, they, they are typically uh, EPC grade Ds, 
and then to bring that up to a B close to an A is going to be it's going to be a a, a thirty thousand pound investment either by the seller or by the buyer. Um, uh, but but there are many estimates that suggest this is this is going to be a lot higher. So every uh, uh, you know this, the, the, that that estimate um, is 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 uh, out by a factor of two. So the houses are going to be uh, going to cost sixty thousand pounds to retrofit. Now, some analyses uh, say that that's equivalent to knocking the house down and build it again. Now, if you think about that in terms of the whole country having to spend the equivalent of the bricks and mortar cost of their house, this is going to add up to, to around two trillion pounds. And that's just for a reduction in the UK's CO2 emissions of one sixth. So if that's representative of what net zero is going to cost us by 2050, um, we're in for a bill which or the, the public is going to have to, 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 to meet of 12 trillion. Um, so so uh, that, then that amounts to approximately 185,000 pounds per person that the net zero agenda is going to cost them um, between now and 2050. So that, that's, that's more than I think most people, that's more than sort of GDP per capita um, uh, 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 measurements would, would seem to make affordable, would, would, su would suggest are affordable. I forget what the GDP per capita is, but that, that 185,000 is, is a good many years of GDP per capita. So the uh, Labour Party conference, I guess Dharma talked a bit about some of these uh, retrofitted houses in, in one of the uh, Labour councils in the area and said, you know, it's a successful project. But it cost them £60,000 to retrofit the house. Right. And the saving was £350 per year. So for the house owner, they have to live till they're like 200 years old in order to kind of realise the saving. In yeah, well, well, they won't ever realise the saving because right. the interest on £60,000, um, which has to be met by someone, I mean, you, you could in theory offer people interest-free loans, but the money has to have, it, it will, will, someone will still have to be uh, paying the interest, whether that's a social, you know, that's, that's taken through taxation or whether it's taken through the, the, the you know, the, the, the loan direct, uh, for repayments from the loan directly. So uh, si uh, 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 interest rates currently, I think they're about 6.5% or so. So the interest on 60, th you, you're going to be paying 6.5% six, uh, 6 on a 60,000 pound loan each year. That's, that's way more than the, the savings. So the, save, uh, the energy savings, the, the, the reduced cost of the energy savings. So it will, uh, it, <laughs> no one will ever repay that loan. Right, at the rate at which it's paid back. I mean, you, you, could, you could, if you had £60,000 spare, you could go out tomorrow and, and buy that stuff. But, and, and, and then you'd, never, well, you'd have to replace the stuff eventually. You know, you'd have to replace the solar panels and the heat pump. It would all wear out. But, um, uh, you know, in the, in the terms offered by the Labour Party, it's a straightforward lie. Um, you, you know, they, 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 they sort of have this magic idea that... that, that um, that this is a, this is a, a saving, a cost saving, but it's it's. Um, I think it's a, 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 they're selling a false prospectus. I think I think they they they. they it, it's a mystery to me why they haven't done the basic arithmetic and why why they why they continue to push it, and I, and I wonder, you, you know, are they are they uh, are they just headed for the same uh, end, end as Boris Johnson? Because this is this is this is inevitably arithmetically straightforwardly leading towards a crisis. Because when you, when you put this burden um, on, in front of everyone, they're going to have to react in some way. Um, and, and, and I worry that that's going to really destabilize the United Kingdom, which is already politically increasingly chaotic. Um, and that's going to require ever more draconian legislation to try, to try and um, manage. You know, we're going to be managing a deep political crisis. Um, and that doesn't bode well. And sticking with the effect of net zero on, on mm -hmm. the ordinary person, there's also transport. Right. Uh, so obviously the, the push for electric cars is a very real push that we can all see. But a lot of people rely on kind of the second-hand car market mm -hmm. and trains are getting more expensive, less reliable. Um, how can we see the, uh, the effect on ordinary people of this? Well, so, uh, the, the freedom of transport, is essentially freedom of movement, 
the, that's going to be abolished uh, effectively by um, net zero if they if they if the government goes through with its plans to abolish new new car sales um, and increasing the um, punitive taxes on 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 on, um, on petrol and diesel. I mean, it's incalculable the, the differences it makes. It means it means families are no longer going to be able to sort of go and see grandma at the weekend. It's going to be, people aren't going to be able to make those uh, shopping trips. It means a great deal of informal social care is not going to be able to 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 uh, be provided to people. You know, so if you have elderly relatives, maybe you take them to social events, maybe you take them to hospital. Um, you know, some people require two or three uh, visits to hospital a week um, in order to, to, to keep them healthy. Um, and that's going to be made more and more and more difficult, and those people are going to be made more and more dependent on, on, um, on, on provision from, from the state and the health service and so on and so forth. I, I think the, uh, in, in some senses, though, the discussion about what's going to happen to cars is a little bit misleading because what's really, what's really happening is um, not at the national level where they where they decide that well, you know they're going to ban the car, but at the local level. So you can see through um, local government through uh, places like Birmingham and Oxford and, and now in Canterbury and I think Bristol and Bath have these quite restrictive uh, anti-car policies such as low traffic neighbourhoods LTN schemes, where they block off uh, large large parts of residential areas to traffic or to through traffic. I mean, you can still get in and out. And this creates congestion throughout these cities. And then the, the sort of next wave of this seems to be the, the experiments, the policy experiments in places like Oxford and, and uh, Canterbury, where they're now talking about cons uh, creating zones within the city. So I think there's about six zones in Oxford where they will, uh, where residents will only be able to use their cars to cross the border within their own city twice a week or they'll face a fine of about 70 pounds so so it's not it's not necessarily going to come from national government it may come from 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 the you know the real attacks on on the freedom of movement will come from local government getting very ambitious about uh, enforcing the green agenda um, and again you know so so it's it's uh, that sort of stuff can can go ahead uh, can, can, that, that, those kind of policies can be implemented, w you know, without a proper public debate, without that being on the manifestos, because all the parties agree in, with, with it. In, in you know, there's a consensus between local uh, Conservative, Labour, and Lib Dem and Green parties. It's almost like a almost closing ranks against the public, and so they they um, they decide, well, we're gonna we're gonna save the planet by making Oxford car free, without having a proper consultation. Um, and that is how people are going to be kept in their homes. They won't be able to travel for work or to work, and they won't be able to help their families out. They won't be able to provide that informal social care. I think we also touch on jobs. I remember mm. when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister in 2009 or so, yeah. he said there would be these 1.3 million um, yeah. green jobs by 2017. But did this green industrial revolution happen? Uh, no, no, right. So there, there's been several green industrial revolutions. There have been lots of attempts to say that we're on the on the cusp of this green industrial revolution. Um, and uh, it, yeah, the Labour government of two, uh, of 2008 promised promised it. And then uh, uh, Chris Hune, as uh, uh, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, uh, made the same promise. But I think he'd sort of downgraded it a bit to I think maybe 200,000 uh, green jobs. So the, the Labour Party's uh, policy initiative was called the uh, the Green New Deal, and then the Liberal Democrats and took Conservative Party coalition was called the Green Deal, um, and and then that got reinvented um, by Boris as his ten point plan for a green industrial revolution. So the all the all the parties, the major parties operating in Britain, have promised a, a green industrial revolution of one form or another, but have have, have not delivered either the revolution. Or the jobs, and I, I, I would say it's uh, it, it, what's most interesting about it is, in, typically in an industrial revolution, you make things more abundant, uh, and more cheap, uh, uh, and uh, and more uh, uh, reliable, right? So, but none of those things has happened. Energy has become less reliable, more expensive, 
um, and, and more scarce, right? So, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it might be a revolution, but it's not an industrial revolution. I would think of it more of as an unrevolution, uh, uh, you know, a, a degradation or devolution. It's a, it's a, it's a backward step in, in the terms of an industrial revolution. So it's a, a slogan that's a, that's a lie, industrial revolution. It's, it hasn't happened. It won't happen. The final question with Net Zero. Um, when Rishi Sunak was the Chancellor, he mm. talked about rewiring the entire financial system for mm. Net Zero. Why do politicians uh, support Net Zero so much? I, I don't think we have politicians as such. I think we use, where the, the, you know, there, there, there is, it would be very difficult to, and make, but many people have made this observation, it would be very difficult to say what the Labour Party um, and its differences to the Conservative Party are in 2022 in the way that uh, you could have done that in the 1970s or 80s or maybe even the 90s, right? But actually, um, there, there's, there's a convergence, there's a consensus in Westminster um, political parties. And, and so, you know, the important political questions don't get debated in the way that they did in the, the more democratic era. I think many people have pointed out this is a, this is a post-democratic era and, and peop, you know, people's consent to governance is, is sort of taken for granted. You get to vote for a red one or a yellow one or a blue one or a green one, but actually the, the, there's no real contest of ideologies. There's no balancing of constituencies to, that goes on in that, that process. So it's, it's completely different from the sort of post-war post -war era. Um, and I think that's most reflected in, if you look at the way, um, the, the, amid the chaos of the Conservative Party, the collapse of the government um, that, that we've been witnessing, the Labour Party's sort of first policy initiative, its flagship policy initiative, has been to announce a, I think it's called the, 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 uh, green, pos the, the green Prosperity Plan, or, or some, some such thing. It's you know, been announced by Keir Starmer at the, the, the uh, party conference and by the... Uh, by Ed Miliband, but um, it's just Boris Johnson's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution. It's just the same thing. It's the, the, we're going to triple um, investment in wind farms, or the number of wind farms in the, in the sea, you know, that's, uh, and we're going we're to increase solar panels. It's just what Boris Johnson said, and these are the flagship policies. So you have um, this oscillation where, where in which po po political parties in the ascendant, make the same promises as the ones that are descendant, but they don't. You know, there's no, well, there's no ideological difference. Um, so I think politicians, MPs from political parties, and minister, you know, senior politicians, just don't really know what to do with their their positions and their power, and and the green the green agenda, so to speak, has sort of arrived in this moment of. Of, demo of break democratic breakdown that sort of happened over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and it's been a godsend to them. So, well, now we're about something. Now we're about saving the planet. Um, and so and it's very attractive to them. The problem is they haven't been able to bring the public on board. Right? So it's, it's, it's uh, um, you know, they, they can... They can claim to be responding to all these great big global challenges and ex problems that are external to British politics. Um, but really, they're, they're sort of in, 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 how would I put it? They're, they're, they're managing, they're the politicians of an alternate reality. They're very much divorced from the reality that's experienced by 65 million British people every day. You know, they've got their own agenda. You mentioned wind farms there. Uh, ten years ago, you, you made a film um, criticising mm. the investment in wind power. In Ten years later, how do you feel about that now? Shortly after we made the film, um, the, 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 there was a new policy, a new energy market uh, policy, energy bill. And this created this energy market reform, I think it was called. Um, and this cr changed the system of subsidies that were in effect previously. Um, and then in around 2017, all the offshore, or, or offshore wind farm operators that were bidding 
um, for future delivery contracts, started putting in these really low bids. And they started saying, uh, and, and so, so the green movement started saying, look, uh, wind, wind, the costs of wind farms are coming down. They're going to be they're going to be cheaper than gas, and they're going to be cheaper than than than, um, than coal. But what happened was, um, over the last few years, as we've seen, um, those those contracts for difference, those strike prices, have not been realised. Rather than selling to the market at the prices the wind farm developers um, had offered, they've been selling. At the, at the current market rate of electricity. They've reneged on what we thought were contracts. Um, so it, it was for nothing, right? So no, no, no wind farm has produced at a price lower than gas, despite that being the claim that, uh, that everyone has been, every, you know, all the advocates of green energy have been making since 2017. And you can see hundreds of headlines. They even ran adverts um, just down the road here in Westminster, around the tube station, they ran adverts saying, wind power is now the cheapest form of energy. Well, it's just a lie. You know, it was, it was, it was, they were fake bids. They were fake, they, they, it, 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 they never had any intention of delivering price, uh, energy at the prices they were, they were promising. It's bad faith. Um, and, and no one seems to be willing to, you know, acknowledge this in Westminster, that it's been a failure, that the, 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 the second round of green energy policy making has been a complete and total failure. We're left with very high prices, and as a result of the high prices, none of the wind farm um, operators are willing to, uh, to, to meet their obligations and, and, and lower those prices. All the emphasis, all of the, you know, all of the discussion about why prices are high is focused on Russia and energy com uh, hydrocarbon energy companies. So, so we're being misled yet again about the, the, the causes of our, our current situation. So let's talk about climate science more, right. more generally. Um, for at least 50 years, we've heard the world will end soon. Mm -hmm. um, such and such country will, will disappear into the ocean. Um, but then when the date comes, the prediction doesn't happen. Are the current doomsday yeah. predictors finally right, or are we just going to keep repeating history on this issue? I think, I think we're in for a, a, a more catastrophic collision with reality um, if we carry on allowing um, uh, policies to base, be based on uh, computer modeling fantasies. So in the 19, early 1970s, the, the predictions of uh, doom were sort of born out of... of, of uh, Global think tanks such as the Club of Rome, who who, who um, had conceived of a, a natural limits to growth, right? So they believed that if we carried on, if business as usual carried on, in 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 the 19s through the 1970s and 80s, we would very soon hit the limits of of um, the planet's ability to sustain us in their conception of things, and they predicted things like um, uh, there would be mass famines in in, in India. Um, Britain would cease to exist, I think. You know, these, are, these are claims from um, sci uh, uh, people like Paul Ehrlich, um, author of The Population Bomb at the time. So they, made the, you know, they, they built these computer models that made these fantastically awful um, predictions for the future of society. And then, of course, we all got very richer. And, 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 and you, you, know, you can see now that the contemporary version of those 1970s failed predictions is, is the climate emergency, right? So everyone, so you hear Greta or you hear some uh, Just Stop Oil activists and they'll be saying, thousands of people are dying now. And then when you actually, you go through the data, and I'm not talking about data produced by climate skeptics like me, I'm talking about the UN data, you know, or, or, or uh, data from the WHO. Who's dying where and what and how, you know, what from, what the causes of death. The number of deaths from uh, natural disasters is, is just on this huge precipitous decline. It's been falling even since the 90s and 2000s. It's, it's like this. All the, all the, 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 um, the, de the number of deaths from um, uh, communicable diseases, from like malaria and, um, or, or disease, and, and deaths from malnutrition are, are, are half the rates that they were in the 1990s, or, or, or less, less than half. So, so there is no evidence of a climate crisis, quite straightforwardly, right? People are wealthier, they're living longer, and they're living healthier. But all the models 
that that uh, are used to, to sort of try and um, demonstrate the existence of, of a climate crisis say that the, the risks are rising. So, so what's happened is there is a conception of risk within climate science that's completely divorced from uh, everyday, ordinary understanding of risk, whereby uh, something is a, a risk is a... Uh, a measure of a frequency of something, right? So uh, what climate scientists or what climate advocates do is they say the risk of something is growing, even though in the real world we can see that the risk of something is diminishing, because they say in a simulated version of the world in which there is no global warming, fewer people would have died than have died, right? So you're saying if we'd, if we'd made a policy, if we'd have eliminated all climate change, uh, or, or, or CO2 emissions, then there would be half the death rate that we now observe from, from malaria, right? But this is, too, this is not science. This is not this, they're making statements about a fantasy world that exists in a computer simulation. They're not making statements about the real world. They're not doing science. They're, they're doing ideological fantasy. You know, it's, 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 it's some kind of role playing. Um, <coughs> Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, th I think unless that, uh, that, those mistakes, those ideological fantasies are exposed to policymakers, we are going to continue to make those, those mistakes um, ad infinitum. It seems um, if anyone does speak out against the general narrative, um, they're, they're kind of not really heard, and a lot of people from academia from the media who do that just uh, have, have vanished. Um, why is society so against people speaking out the other side of this argument? Um, one reason is there's, there's a lot of money. Right. Um, the, in, the, in, in the past, it's been climate skeptics who are assumed to have been funded by big oil. Um, but this was, I think this is a case of projection. Actually, um, there's, an, there's an awful lot of money that goes into, um, from philanthropic foundations. So there's, you know, people like Mike Bloomberg have spent $10 billion on, I think it might be $11 billion on, on financing uh, NGOs of various, con various concerns, right, over, over the last few years. And you can find um, other billionaires uh, like Christopher Hone, the British billionaire, he, he spent in the in I think 2021 around 200 million in in on on on, on green campaigning organisations and and that would include um, a lot of outfits in academia. So you, you know these some of these research schools um, at Oxford University, for example, they they have the name of their benefactors over them. There's the the Smith School of uh, of, of um, the Smith School of uh, Sustainability, I think, in, in Oxford, and there's the Mar Oxford Martin School, and uh, you know there's the Grantham Institute. There are all these sort of um, prestigious, or seemingly prestigious organisations at universities in, in Britain um, that just they just they just sort of essentially turn a university from a place of free and independent inquiry and investigation into a glorified think tank, into a sort of uh, 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 you know. A, well, just that, a, a, th a think tank. There's one in Bath, I think, called the Centre for Climate and Social Transformation. It takes millions of pounds from, um, uh, from in, you know, uh, philanthropic interests, right, with no questions really asked about that, that kind of agenda. Um, you know, so, it's, I mean, it's right to investigate whether big oil is, you know, using its money to, to alter the public debate, but very few questions get asked about the extent to which um, the green movement is is funded in precisely this way. It's corporate money, billionaires' money, and so on and so forth. Um, so when you when you sort of come up against um, academics who are very determined that society must be must be changed, um, they haven't come from a discipline which has been uh, you, you know which is ho or, or an organisation which is home to. Uh, people of different 
persuasions, people with different perspectives, you know, who've been led there by their own research. Like, like you know, you're not going to get at one of these organisations someone like me. You're not going to get someone who's like, sceptical of climate change or someone who's sceptical of green ideology. There's a huge amount of alignment that's been produced by these volumes of money, these torrents of money, across civil society and across academia, um, the whole purpose of which is to align them. Right? So, you know, I don't, I don't come across many uh, organisations that intervene, be that Oxfam or, or, a, or a think tank or an academic organisation. I don't see many of them that make interventions into the, in climate policy that haven't, one way or another, been financed by maybe half a dozen philanthropic organisations that exist precisely to align civil society um, to the climate agenda. So what I'm suggesting is, although civil society uh, and civil society organisations depends on philanthropy, so you know, and civil society is a good thing, we've reached a point now where civil society has been completely bought uh, by philanthropy, and I'll put philanthropy in quotes, because it's no longer philanthropy, right? It's, 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 it's a political lobbying force now. That sounds quite a worrying situation. What, what can we do to turn that around? Um, well, I think we have to put more expectations on our politicians. I think we have, to, we have to say it's not enough for you to just wave a report from this think tank or that, uh, that academic institution in debates about policy. You, you, you're accountable as an MP to us as, as voters. Um, and so I think, and I think we have, maybe have to sort of change our expectations of the mainstream political parties as part of that. But, you know, that's a big ask too. So, yeah, I think we're in for a bit of a political crisis in that respect. You mentioned before um, Just Stop Oil. It seems in recent times there's been an explosion of these fairly extreme um, environmental protesters. Yeah. I mean, where did they all suddenly come from? Um, they've always been around. They've been lingering around the edges. They're not part of the, well, they're not, they're not you know, the people you see on the street aren't necessarily part of what you might call the green blob. They don't necessarily work in green organisations. A lot of them do, but um, in, in general they don't. Sociologically, I think they're from the sort of slightly dysfunctional middle and upper middle classes. Um, psychologically, I think there's a, a very detectable... Uh, I think there, there's a lot of narcissism in these campaigns. And, and what I, I would suggest is that societies or, or political parties and government's failure to confront green ideology has given license to a lot of these slightly weird narcissists. Um, you know, so we, we haven't really... Society, media, government hasn't confronted alarmism, essentially. And the, the green, in green ideology is smuggled in through these very um, alarmist claims. So you hear, you hear these activists saying millions of people are going to die. Uh, but when you, you know, when you try and show them that millions of people aren't dying and aren't going to die, they get angry, right? So, so um, you know, there's no... There's no if, there, if that conversation had been had through the 2000s and the 2010s, and we said, yeah, climate change might be happening, and it might be a problem for certain people in certain, particular, certain times, and we should confront it, um, you know, at some point in our, in our own good time, then these, this green ideology would not have festered, and we would not have uh, lunatics, quite frankly, on the streets of Britain. But because we didn't have that conversation, now we have to deal with people blocking roads and, 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 and smashing things and, and, and worse, and God knows where it's going to go next. Um, so uh, the, 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 the broader answer, the deeper answer and historical answer of where they're from is in the middle of the last decade um, and around the time that Brexit and Trump um, were happening. So these things sent huge shocks through what you might call globalization or globalism. Um, and there was an attempt to rescue, or there was a desire to rescue, um, particularly the green agenda from the collapse of the globalization, or the process of, glo uh, 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 from 
from the renationalization, as it were, of of, dom of domestic politics. Right. So, uh, how how can we rescue? Uh, they wanted to know how could we rescue the green agenda, um, and what I think you know there, there are various ways that that that, that uh, attempt to reassert globalism happened. But in the green movement, what happened was. Um, uh, a, a lot of attention got paid to an idea called the climate mobilization, which is a thesis written by a woman called uh, Margaret Klein Salomon. And now she, 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 um, her hypothesis was that you, she was a psychologist. So she said rather than um, using, rather than a clinical psychologist um, attempting to soothe people's anxieties, um, you could you could invert that, so you could create a sense of panic and a create a sense of fear about the future to mobilise the public. I mean, it's straightforward, straightforward fear, fear mongering. Um, and they believed that if you if you so, in the words of um, Gail Bradbrook, who was one of the the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, for example, they believed that if you could tell the public that climate change was equivalent to ten Hitlers not just one Hitler, like the Second World War, 10 Hitlers, um, uh, then you could, you could get the whole public on board. They would behave in the future exactly as the way they sort of behaved in World War II. They would um, do what you tell them. They'll, they'll, they'll you know, against the, the 10 Hitlers. Um, but this has failed because all the, 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 the Extinction Rebellion have done is sort of made fools of themselves on TV. I mean, as much as the the, the TV uh, the TV crews have been there to try and help Extinction Rebellion make its point, um, what's happened is um, people have seen them and become very angered by them. Uh, the, and the government, the government too, the UK government too. I mean, there's a there's a a video of uh, uh, of Michael Gove meeting Extinction Rebellion for an hour long sit down, barely six months after they'd been formed. So the, the Extinction Rebellion were, were very convenient to the government that wanted to press ahead with net zero because the government believed it was a representation, a public, you know, a, an expression of popular will. The, the government wanted Extinction Rebellion to, to be successful in mobilising the public to supporting the net zero agenda. But, um, you know, so, so, so he, he, he invited them for a, for a chat, which no organisation that's a... a as far as most people can tell, is criminal in its intent. I mean, no organisation of that kind has ever, you know, been able to sit down with the government and say, here are our, here are our wishes, you know. So it was, uh, in many respects, then, Extinction Rebellion is like a performance um, that the government has agreed to, in which the Extinction Rebellion pretends to be the public and the government pretends that they're the public, and then they sit down, and then they pretend that there's a consensus between the government and the public now for the net zero agenda, but it's just a fiction. So um, these uh, Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion protesters, they don't take the traditional way of going and protesting outside of the mm. oil companies' offices with their banners. They instead seem to protest almost against the public. They're in the supermarket, tipping milk on the floor, yeah, uh, they're blocking yeah. people from going to work. They're even blocking emergency vehicles. Mm. Uh, how should we understand this you know, quite different way of basically protesting a against the public? Well, it's quite hard not to see um, in, in Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil and these other offshoots of Extinction Rebellion nothing but contempt for the public in reality. So, so um, when Extinction Rebellion was formed in 2018, their, one of their initial demands was net zero by 2025. And of course they believed that they could get the public to come with them on that demand. But actually what that demand meant was that there would be no cars, right? there'd be no uh, flights, there'd be no supermarkets, there'd be no industry. You know, it's a, a massive, huge and unprecedented transformation of, of society and, and a, a, an enormous reduction in, in standards of living and increased costs, you know, it's, it's, it's incalculable. And our, my suggestion is that the, the, um, there's no precedent for that kind of transformation in society or in history, history uh, without tanks, without guns and troops uh, on the streets enforcing that kind of severe austerity, 
You know, that outside of wartime, there's, it's, 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 in, it's implausible, right? You know, you, and we, you know, maybe we take Venezuela as, as, as the model for such a, a radical transformation. Um, it doesn't end well. It's not a good process. So these, these people have extreme demands on society that have no, no, no um, hope of being met. I mean, and, and so it is an attack on... It is an attack on the public. It's an attack on the majority of the population. Um, it's hostile to industry. It's hostile to industrial society. They may claim every now and then they're yeah, what well, it's not, you know, that they want they want things to be continue, able to continue peacefully. But but um, to the extent that they have a coherent view, um, it's uh, it, it can't it can't but end in disaster. I mean, it's it's. It, if, if it could, it would have happened, right? Um, but, but we haven't even got to a very significant reduction in CO2 emissions, as they keep telling us. Well, why? They think it's just arbitrary, right? But it's not. There's, there's a reason why climate policy has been slow to, to, to achieve any significant results. And that's because it's, it's, it's uh, unworkable. And it's and, and 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 you know we can see now the rise in the cost of energy. That's that's because of green policy, right? That that so so and and look and look at the problems it's causing. But you you can't get you can't get Extinction Rebellion to to take any notice of those those claims. So they'll 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 continue um, their campaigns and and in the hope that they can uh, enforce that. Um, over, over, over the rest of us. I mean, it, they, they, look, these selfish, they're selfish um, it, from the se from you know from the, their ideology is selfish from the start. There's no, there's no real idea about how society will function within you know if XR's plans are realised. They're not, they're not a co a ideologically coherent movement. They're just, it's just a performance, right? Um, we should, and we should. I think we should also not get too hooked on what Extinction Rebellion want. Um, Extinction Rebellion can block a road and ruin your day, but uh, it's a government that can ruin your life, right? It's policymakers who are who are who are who are going to do the damage, not not idiots with fluoro hair and silly clothes. You know, it's 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 a different. We've got to be focused about what really counts. And Paul, thanks for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thanks so much, Lee.